So this is always my favorite session of the three. For those who may be just coming today, um, you were in the last one, but it doesn't presuppose you heard anything that Stephanie, who is to my right, brought either last night or this morning. Uh, but this one is always my favorite one, which might lead you to ask, how could it be my favorite one? Because she hadn't said anything yet. Uh, and she was really pretty good last night, pretty good this morning. Uh, it's, it's my favorite because I'm joined by, by my students here and the students of other faculty members, the four of us in the religion department um, take delight in, in students, as I'm sure every department takes delight in their students. And probably the faculty see students by major, maybe more than students. And I've often said the only people doing interdisciplinary work on campus are the students because they run all over the place taking science classes and humanities classes. And then I see them in the rec center because they're athletes and at SIG, the Center for Innovation and Growth. So they truly are the interdisciplinary people. And some of us get stuck in a more narrow world and think that's it. So this is my favorite favorite part of the, of the program. Stephanie Paul Sell, to my right, um, has been with us since about noon yesterday. And I'll leave it to you to read the, the uh, biographical piece. It's still the same person that came last night. She still has the same degrees and wrote the same book. And <laughs> so uh, that part hasn't changed. What has changed is um, she really came as a, as a guest at noon yesterday to most of us probably a stranger. Stephanie and I have been involved in a, in a group called the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality, which she actually led for a year or two. So I've known her as a friend longer, but she came yesterday at noon basically as a stranger to most of us. And by now, she feels more like uh, a friend to so many of us and um, one who has just fit in. In fact, I won't be surprised early next week to hear that Bob Helmer's negotiating with her to leave Harvard and <laughs> come here, which would be a good thing for us. And I don't know, Harvard's got quite a few good people, so they might not even miss her. <laughs> but actually, as I've gotten to know Stephanie, I think Harvard would miss her because it's one thing to be a really smart person. It's another person to be smart and somebody that you actually like being with. And as one who has two degrees from Harvard, not everybody there were people that uh, I wanted to be with most of the time. So Stephanie is a rare bird, and uh, that's a compliment to be called a rare bird. Um, it's how we speak in the Midwest. Uh, I have two daughters, and, and I really do uh, love them, but they don't hang out with me much. So um, the delight of being a faculty person is you have five like this, and I'm sure if you see the other three colleagues of mine smiling a lot, it's because I was able to get five of our very best to say, yes, I'll be on the panel. Um, like my two daughters, I really do trust these people. All that I did was to say, I'd like for you to frame a question, and then Stephanie will get to answer the question. And I remember being really early in graduate school wondering if I ever would learn enough that I could just sit like Stephanie's going to do, not knowing what's going to come, and feel <laughs> like you know enough to be, able, to be able to answer something intelligently. And so part of my sneaky agenda is to let the students see somebody model that really fairly well. In fact, it's not even easy to ask good questions. And so I really do trust these. I have no clue what they're going to ask, but I do trust them. So let me just introduce them. Um, Laura and Sophia and Sophia and Jonathan, JJ, and Matt on the end. And, and it really is hard to resist telling all the stories about the classes they've been with me and others and, and what neat folks they are. Um, so I'm going to get out of the way and let Matt, I think, is going to ask the first question, and then Stephanie's going to respond. Um, my question relates to how you began your lecture last night. You began with a story from your childhood, a narrative, relating now, since literature is such an important part of your study of religion, my question for you is, do you see spirituality and the formation of spirituality as a narrative, in a sense? And if so, how? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Alan is right. The hard part is figuring out the questions. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit this morning. The great, you know, Christian teacher about narratives about life. Once alive, of course, is Augustine. And he wrote his great confessions and kind of cracked the world open for everybody that came afterwards. Um, and 
you know, there's always a sense in Augustine of him looking for that one thread that he can pull and pull and pull and pull until he can find God's hand at the end of it. Um, but he also, there's also a sense in him of understanding that he may be imposing a structure on, on his, you know, on the chaos of his life, um, which any of us do if we try to tell a story about who we are um, and where we came from and what matters to us. Um, I do think that for me, story and narrative is a really important source for spirituality. Alan asked that question this morning, are you trying to do autobiography as spirituality, which I liked better than autobiography as theology, somehow because spirituality is concerned with practices, with ways of life, with how we live, and um, how we work at the intersections of theological thinking and practical living. Um, and I do think the work of trying to, to tell our stories, the work of trying to find the thread to pull and to find the language to communicate something, things that are really important to us but that may lie a little bit beyond the ability of language to really describe. I think that's really holy work. Um, so yes, I think um, for me, stories are a, a really important source of spirituality and, and of sort of constructing what we understand our spirituality to be. Does that answer your question? Yes. Well, I, I suppose I can go next. Um, you spoke a lot this morning about the experimental certainties with yeah. Simone Weil, and that was so interesting, and I think um, that's something I've kind of been thinking about, not in those exact terms, but I'm interested to know, um, like, is a spiritual component necessary or important for the world of religious studies, and uh, um, like question. personally or as yeah. like an academic thing? Yeah. I'm just yeah. curious about that. That's a really good question, um, and you know, I teach in a place that both trains ministers and trains the next generation of professors. And there's plenty of people who are very, very religious in, all, in both of those categories. But there's also plenty of people who aren't themselves religious, um, but who are very interested in religion and the study of religion and interested enough to devote their lives to it. Now, as I suggested last night, I do think that in everybody's project, there is some you know, there's some reason that we come to give ourselves to this work. It doesn't really pay that well. It doesn't, you know, it's not, you know, there are other things you can do with your life. And if you're going to, if you're going to really give yourself to this work, there has to be some, I don't know, something in your core that makes you want to answer these kinds of questions. So even what it means to be religious, I'm never quite... Sure. Um, somebody, I, who was it? Um, so someone said to me this morning, I think she's not here, um, but she's a nun. She lives in a religious community. Oh, you, no. Um, we have had many wonderful. It was who we were talking to this morning at breakfast. The woman we were, she had to leave. She had been in a community. She had, she had been in a community. Okay. So she said, you know, she had studied in both. Um, a, a sort of church-related sort of seminary-type setting, and that she had also studied in a state university religious studies department, and that the state university religious studies department felt really holy to her because every because every every religion was being studied, and you could really get a sense of you know the 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 human you know dimension of the of religion and of religion as a deeply human experience um, and that everybody worked so hard and was so careful in making their arguments and although they may or may not have been themselves religious she could tell it was really holy work. Um, I think there's different parts of our lives where we kind of need different things like if you grew up in a really um, in a religious tradition that really explained things to you in a very complete sort of way, to study religion from a, a sort of non-theological perspective can really be free and can really open things up and, and help us see new things. And sometimes if you've been in that world, to, to study with people who, who want to not only study religion but help it have a continued life in the world can be really free and can crack up in the world. So I think we need all of this. Um, and 
what I long for in my own colleagues and in my own students are, are just people who are agile enough to move around among these different perspectives um, and honor, you know, give them all the honor that they're due. It's very easy in contexts like mine to slip into religious studies versus theology, but that has never gotten us anywhere, I think. Um, I do think at HDS, when we have doctoral students preparing to be professors, many of them are going to go on and teach in non-church related institutions. Um, because they're studying next to people who understand themselves to have a vocation, a calling, um, they often come to want to talk about their own teaching vocation like that as something they're called to do. Um, and I think it's so. I, I think it's great for everybody to study together. Um, everybody who's concerned with religion from all the different perspectives, because I do think we rub off on each other um, in some really good ways. But I wouldn't ever. I guess to answer your question, I would never say you must be religious in order to study religion, or something I've heard other people say, you cannot be religious and study religion. Um, there's plenty of people who will say that too. Um, that, you know, if, if you have a religious perspective, then you're going to be, so your, your view's gonna be so subjective, you're not gonna be able to see what's really there. Well, we're all shaped in various ways by various perspectives. We all have a subjective perspective on, on everything. Um, so that has never made much sense to me. But, um, but I think to, you know, to be in a department like yours um, where you have people who have religious commitments and in different traditions and different ways of being religious and um, people who are really committed to the study of the religions of the world and the theories and methods of how, you know, how do we understand ourselves as religious people, how do, what, how do we know what a religion is, what is religion. Um, I think it's great to have it all together because I think, you know, wherever at the end of the day you feel that you belong, um, you'll be influenced by all of it. And I think that's, I think to understand religion, we need to be able to see kind of all the way around it, why it matters to people, um, as well as its long history, et cetera. Great question. Thank you. Well, I can go. Um, a little bit of a change of pace. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that as a part of your own life, you were in a town that really had a hard time with desegregation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was wondering how growing up in that environment affected you and your spirituality, or maybe yeah. who you are as a person now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, that's a great question too. Um, Wilson, North Carolina. Wilson, Wilson, North Carolina is where I grew up, and, and I talked this morning in my St. Therese talk about when I was in, going into second grade, my town, that it was 1970, which of course is a long time after Brown versus the Board of Education, but my my town was finally told by the courts you have to integrate, and so that they just closed the schools, all of them, and didn't tell our parents when they were going to open, and so I went to St. Therese Catholic School, which was already integrated, long integrated. And um, that, going to St. Therese had a huge impact on me. Um, and I, and forever after, kind of associated Catholicism with racial justice and um, reconciliation and community. Um, the nuns who taught me there were really, um, they were just amazing people. And, and I wanted to be like them, I wanted to be them, and I have not achieved that yet, but I, I have tried to follow in their footsteps as best as I can. But, um, I, you know, I grew up in eastern North Carolina when I was, I think I told this story this morning, when um, there was the Abbey of Gethsemane, which has come up several times in the last couple of days, had an experimental monastery in a little town about 90 miles from where I grew up, Oxford, North Carolina, that was run by a friend of my father's, Father Matthew Kelty. And we would go there a lot. My dad would take his students there a lot. And when you would drive into town, there was a big billboard that said, you know, the Ku Klux Klan welcomes you to Granville County. And it, it was, it was, that's the world. Uh, the, that's, that was the world. Um, but even in the midst of, of some pretty virulent racism, there are always amazing people, any, any place like that, there's always amazing people working for justice. And um, that impacted me a lot. Um, seeing my dad's students, um, you know, working in the Civil Rights Movement, resisting the Vietnam War, you know, all, all of those issues that were happening at the time. 
um, were very, very inspiring to me. Matthew Kelty, the monk who was running this little monastery, walked from Oxford to, to um, D.C. to protest the war um, when I was 11 years old, and, and that had a big impact on me. Um, can I repeat a story I told this morning? What, am I going to say no? Yeah, that's right. He's not going to say no. I'll just do what I want. Um, when I was a little girl, about 11, um, my father, I would ride my bike to meet my dad at the end of the day, and he was riding his bike home, and I was ready to meet him, and I could see him from a distance riding his big black twin bicycle with this huge box on it and trying to balance, and he was shouting. And when I got closer to him, I could hear what he was shouting was, I've got a treasure, I've got a treasure. And our friend Matthew Kelty had finally gotten permission from his abbot to go be a hermit in New Guinea, where he had been a missionary many years before. And he left my father a, all his papers in a box, in just one box. And it had sermons, it had letters about, a lot of the letters that he wrote from Oxford to Gethsemane were about the racial situation in Oxford. Right before the monks moved in, there was a killing in Oxford where a young African American man was accused of, you know, saying, hey baby, or something to a white woman in a little store. This is 1970, and the guy, and the man who ran the store shot him in the middle of the day. And there were, there were riots, and some of the African-American veterans uh, were burning down some of the um, tobacco barns. And it was, a, it was a really, it was a very intense time in that part of North Carolina. And Matthew, you know, was writing these letters to Gethsemane saying, we can't just come in here and act like none of this is happening. We have got to take a stand. We have got to, you know, be reconciled. We have got to be a place where people of all races come. And so he was thinking all that stuff through. Um, because he had walked to, um, taken that peace walk, there were letters to him from activists from all over the country, and they were, those letters were full of amazing stories about the FBI breaking down their doors, and, you know, they were full of, you know, well-placed four-letter words that I was so interested in, just like, rhetorically, how all that worked, and um, there were Matthew Sermons, he's a great homiletician. If you would like to see Matthew Kelty in action, you can go to the Abbey of Gethsemane website and they have his, many of his Compline talks on, you can watch him give his Compline talks and they're very wonderful. Uh, he was from South Boston and really a raconteur. Um, anyway, um, I would sit on the floor of my dad's study and I would read through this box. And it just, I mean, there, I just loved doing it. And because it was so inspiring and because there were all these lives inside this box of people who were giving themselves over to the good and who were risking themselves for justice, people of all ages, all races, all, you know, mostly they were Christians, I think, in the box. But I think of the religious backgrounds as well. Some, he was in touch with some Buddhists. Um, and, um, you know, now today, it's, when I think about that today, I think that everything I still care about today was in that box. And I, you know, I just wonder if I had, like if my life were in a box, uh, is it something that a child would want to sit on the floor of her dad's study and read through, and would it be, I mean, would a child have the same experience I did, which was of the world just cracking open, and all of this stuff flooding in, and and me having a sense of, oh, I can see, I, I can see where I not, might fit in with this work. Um, it's amazing to me, and this is, I think this is why I keep going back to childhood, that all the things I care about, I encountered in that box when I was 11 years old, and I still care about those things. But anyway, does that answer your question? It, 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 it there were, any time you're in a, any time you're living somewhere where there are, very visible injustices going on. There are also always amazing people resisting them, and that those were the people who inspired. Since I'm a lifelong student, I'm going to ask a question too. Do uh, it. The follow-up question to Laura. I'm going to ask the other half of the question. She asked you to look backwards. Yeah. As you look forward to the rather rather long life that you have yet, what oh, issue or two in the world of religion or spirituality do you see coming up in mm -hmm. the next 30 years, 25 years, however? What, what's ahead yeah. that we are not thinking about yet but will be a, probably a real issue yeah. in your estimation? Well, I think what, in Christianity anyway, what Christian community is going to look like. Is it going to look like what it's looked like 
up until now? I mean, I think that's a real question, and I'm very interested in the experiments that are going on. We talked a little bit this morning about the new monasticism. You should Google that if you've not heard that phrase before. There are groups of mainly, I think, evangelical Christian young people living in what they call the, you know, the broken places of empire in, you know, really blasted out places in this country. And they're living together in community and they're sharing what they have and they're involving themselves with their neighbors and they're praying together and they're looking to the monastic model as a way of thinking about what Christian community might look like going forward. So I'm interested in all the experiments. Um, I think obviously the questions about, you know, now that we're in this globalized world and in this glo globalized schools and you know, in, in my school, in the, the MDiv program, which is traditionally a Christian Unitarian Universalist um, Unitarian Universalist enterprise, now has Jewish students, Muslim students, Buddhist student, students, Christian students, UU students, all preparing for ministry together. Not even just all preparing to study religion together, but preparing for some kind of religious leadership together. And what will that? You know, how do you? How do we educate for religious leadership across religious traditions, multi-religiously? Um, and what, you know, what's that going to mean for how we practice and what we think, what our theology is? And I think that's all really exciting and interesting to me. Um, but I think these questions of how are we going to live, um, are, I think that's why the experimental certainties question is so interesting to me. Because, you know, with global warming, with all of the environmental things that we're facing, um, with the, you know, the growing divide between rich and poor, what, I mean, just how are we going to live, and what does our what do our religious traditions have to do with that, um, and how can we look to them? How do we look to them for resources for how to live in these days? Can we live in a way that might save the world? Um, but I think those are going to be the pressing questions. For me. Um, in your article called Saints and Doubters. Uh -huh. You speak a lot about uh, faith and doubt. Yeah. And I wanted to know if you could, you know, explain where, where what that relation is instead yeah. of it being a difference. Where you see that relation of faith and doubt. Right. Thank you. That's a great question. I this is a little article I wrote right before All Saints Day. I was trying to think about the saints that I wanted to write about. And of course Saint Teresa always occurs to me when saints come up. Um, but I was also reading Virginia Woolf's father's essays on agnosticism. He was a, he, he was a fam famously agnostic Victorian academic who, in those days, you had to be an ordained minister to have an academic position at Cambridge University. He lost his faith. Um, no in the ark was the breaking point for him. And um, he just couldn't believe it anymore. And uh, he went to his you know, colleagues and said, I can't believe this anymore, and he was, he lost his academic position forever. So he really had the courage of his convictions. And he was, I mean, his question is the question that still is being asked, um, which most recently was asked by my humanist chaplain colleague at Harvard, who just wrote a book called Good Without God. Um, can you be good without God? Uh, that was, Leslie Stephen was trying to argue, you know, I have lost my faith, but I am still going to be a gentleman kind of thing. Um, anyway, I was trying to think about, I, it was, I had this column due and it was coming up on All Saints Day and I wanted to say something about All Saints Day and I, I just thought of Leslie Stephen and his daughter Virginia Woolf who was also, you know, raised by him and of course did not, you know, was not baptized or anything and did not have a religious faith to lose like her father did, but she did um, through her art um, really look for these moments of spiritual communion and I think was trying to think through some of these questions about how are we going to live and what kind of spiritual community can help us um, experience those the, the potential connections between us even when we seem so far apart from each other so often. Um, so it felt to me like St. Therese who was also herself lost her, you know, lost what she called the joy of her faith at the end of her life. She said, I, I can't feel, she was dying very young of tuberculosis, painfully, slowly. Um, and she said, I, I, I have even though I have lost the joy of my faith, I'm trying to do what faith requires. Um, and she tried to keep herself turned toward love, even though she couldn't feel it anymore. That consolation, you know. 
and they all just seemed like the, the same kind of saint to me. I don't know. I don't know if, I, if you will allow me to say that, but um, you know, they were all people who wanted to stay, turn toward love. Um, and some of them were, you know, Virginia Woolf was not raised in a religious tradition. St. Therese was. Leslie Stephen rejected his. But still the question was the same and the desire was the same. You know, that in this very difficult world, um, which is marked, you know, by real injustice, um, how to stay, how to live a life that is turned toward love, even when you're in pain, even when you're appalled, even when you can't feel the, the consolation of religion that you might like to feel. Um, and so I did feel that on All Saints Day, I would be celebrating them all under the same sky, you know, the same one sky, um, that, they were, that they were all saints together. And that, you know, you're a, one's agnostic, one's a Christian, one's creating something completely new. Um, they all seem to me to have to be operating out of very similar desires. So I'm not. I guess faith and doubt, um, in that case anyway, didn't seem so opposed. I mean, the question that it just seemed to be different routes for asking the same question. I mean, it's an interesting time, isn't it, with all this, you know, the new atheism, with the new monasticism and the new atheism going on all at the same time. Um, but I always feel like the new atheists are always arguing with this very narrow strip of religion. You know, they're arguing with probably what they encountered as children. That would be my argument. <laughs> but um, uh, they, they don't, you know, they don't seem to know a lot about religion as a human phenomenon, you know, around the world. Um, so I'm never, I'm never very helped by that somehow, by that kind of argument. But, but somebody like Leslie Stephen, who is asking, you know, really serious questions about morality and what one believes. I, I can feel, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not myself of his philosoph. I'm not a philosophical agnostic in the way that he is, but um, but I feel his questions very deeply. I appreciate, you know, the path that he laid, you know, charted for others. Go ahead and ask a question. Um, last night you talked about Saint Augustine of Hippo. Yes. And I thought it was really fascinating that you um, studied his take on, um, I think your student called them the evil babies. The evil babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was uh, it was really fascinating that that you yeah. draw off of children's experiences as not being pure and innocent, but instead as also having flaws and, and experiences, and I wondered if um, maybe that modern view of um, childhood as innocent and maybe even having a connection to, to God or having a deeper spiritual connection has any social, social implications? I think absolutely. That's a really good question. Um, I think, and I really learned this from a former colleague of mine, Bob Orsi, who has done a lot of study on childhood. Um, those markers that we assign to children, innocent, pure, et cetera, um, I mean, they're positive, and they're, you know, it's what you would want for children, right? But, um, but they, you know, they can function as a way for, a, you know, I, I think what I said last night was what adults want for children easily shades into what we want from children. And, yeah, there, I mean, if anybody's a Sunday school teacher, I taught Sunday, I've been teaching Sunday school for, my daughter's whole life. So I've taught from age four to through high school. Um, if you want to feel, what is, how is it Bob puts it? If you want to feel the fictiveness of your faith, try explaining it to a child. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, that is, that is very challenging, I think, to try to, you know, explain one's faith to a child. Um, and I, it, I, it's so easy to fill those, those terms are so sort of empty that it's so easy to fill them up with our fantasies about what children ought to be like. And as soon as we get to that ought, um, then we stop hearing what children's actual experience is. 
um, I was teaching with Bob during the, um, the years when the Boston Globe was gradually breaking all the stories about the abuse of children in our archdiocese, which was a very sad time. And every day it was a new story, a new narrative on the cover of the Boston Globe. And one of the things that Bob pointed out was that these men who wrote these reports and, and moved these priests around from church to church didn't seem to have, the children just seemed invisible to them. Like they couldn't, they couldn't hear them, they couldn't see them. They knew each other, the adults, but they, it was like the children weren't real almost. And um, I think, you know, trying to define children's experience in advance as innocent, pure, et cetera, humble, et cetera, et cetera, um, kind of makes it difficult for us to hear what they're actually telling us. Um, children have lots to say about religion and God and the world and religious life. Um, and I've learned a lot over the years from children. Um, I'll tell you one quick story. When my daughter was in preschool, she came home one day with this rock in her pocket. And um, she took it out and she said, you see this? She said, this is my prayer rock. She said, I hold it to my heart and I thank God for everything she's done for me. And I said, oh yeah? I said, um, where'd you learn that? And she looked at me and she said, from this rock? <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, I, you know, of course, thought someone had put that in her mind, but she learned it from that rock. So, um, you know, I, I think, um, I think I, I've been very convinced by Bob on this issue. There's just how dangerous it can be to load up onto children all of these terms and expectations because they, they don't have enough content somehow, and then we fill them up with, with what we think children ought to be. Where I get one of those rocks? I, I would love to find one of those rocks. One of those speaking rock, talking rocks. <laughs> Matt, I think you did have a second question. Yes, I did. Um, I, since you study Virginia Woolf, yeah. and I, when I think of Virginia Woolf, I immediately think of you know gender identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my question related to that would be, do you think gender or conceptions of gender play a role in spiritual formation? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I mean, I think conceptions of gender play a role in every in all kinds of formation, but certainly in religious formation, and it's a similar similar problem to the problem of children. Um, being able to hear what people are actually saying, and being able to, without you know, rushing in with our own expectations and our own categories, what we think a man's spirituality ought to be, what a woman's spirituality ought to be, what a gay person's spirituality ought to be, what a you know. Just, um, I, I, and this is, you know, we began by, you, you began by asking about stories and narratives. And I do think that's one of the reasons stories and narratives are so important. Because moving so quickly to the theoretical about, you know, women are blah, men are blah, children are blah, you know, um, it just obscures almost everything we actually need to know. Um, and being able to hear people's stories and their specificity um, is just crucial, I think, to, um, I don't know, to moving forward as human beings, much less moving forward in religious community. Um, but absolutely, I think um, uh, we're all formed in that way um, by what you know, we and those around us expect uh, from our gender. But I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I, want, I want to know specifically, since I'm such a fan of Virginia Woolf myself, <laughs> I, I want to know, like, since she took her, her way of understanding yeah. gender was at such an androgynous yeah. level, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe speak specifically to yeah. what, in, her, in your understanding yeah. of what her spirituality was, how yeah. her ideas about gender kind of interacted right. with Right. Her understanding of spirituality. Right, right, right. That's a really good question. Kaylin's here. She's a Virginia Woolf uh, scholar. You have a thought? I mean, I think she ran the gamut. Yeah. I mean, Dick Orlando. Yeah. Um, she, I think the androgyny.
Right. And one of the, you know, on a kind of social level, um, because she was a woman, she did get sent to school. She didn't go to Cambridge like her brothers did. And she really resented that for her whole life, um, that her education was not systematic. It was kind of spotty. And she was, her father educated her out of his library. And he hired brilliant women like, you know, Clara Pater and Janet Case to teach her Greek and that kind of thing. But I think because, and I, I find this all throughout the history of women and Christianity anyway, um, because she was constrained in relation to education, she just had a really unique perspective on everything she studied and everything she read. Um, so she didn't have the Cambridge University line on whatever, on religion, on philosophy, on anything. Um, her brother Toby, who went to Cambridge, once gave her a book. I wish I could remember the name of the book. But his inscription was, there is no God, Toby. <laughs> Which was just like, I think, a family joke. Um, because her father so embodied the idea, there is no God. Um, but um, she, you know, she didn't just follow her father's agnosticism sort of full out. She admired it. And she was definitely formed and shaped by it. But she was very worried that by taking out God, he had just refilled that space with patriarchy. Um, and, and she didn't want to follow him there, right? So, um, so the kind of notions of spirituality that she, which is a word she would never herself use, but um, her conceptions of, of reality, which is a word she would use, um, that, you know, that there, which is a kind of platonic vision of reality that you know, we're all kind of wadded in by the cotton wool of unreality, of non-being, and beneath that is a pattern that connects us all. Um, and that we see that when we have what she called a shock, or a moment of being, where for a minute you could see that we're all connected in one thing, um, in one reality, even though, you know, we may be sitting around the dinner table all thinking something different from what we're saying. Um, so where was I going with that? Um, yeah, that, you know, um, the fact that she was a woman, the fact that there was not gender equality in her day, um, both worked against her and in a way for her because she, you know, instead of going to school and being told what to think, she sat upstairs while Vanessa painted and she read and wrote and thought her own thoughts and did something really new in literature because of that. And you see that, you know, in, in medieval women's writing, um, you know, women, when they didn't have access to books, when they didn't have access to Bibles, when they didn't have access to, you know, the kinds of materials that a lot of the male monastics did, they did theology with their bodies, they did theology with their visions, they did theology with their dreams. Um, they used different, you know, a whole different set of, of sources and came to some different ideas um, out of that. So um, that's another way gender kind of fits in, not in any sort of essentialized women are one this kind of person, but just society constrained their options, and so their creativity ran in a different stream and opened up something new. Others on the panel have a second question? Um, yeah, I kind of have a, a something like a follow-up question to my first one. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, in this field, the profession that you sit in, what is it that you hold on to to keep going during those yeah. times? Can, saying, assuming that times of doubt yeah. and, uh, and the yeah. walk of faith yeah. is inevitable, yeah. How do you, what do you hold on to? What keeps you going? You know, the Abbey of Gethsemane. When, even when I was a little girl, I knew that I knew that somehow I would. That's where I would where my imagination would go in moments of death. When I went to college and was learning all the things that you all are learning and having my foundations yanked out from under me and all of that, I would think about those monks and I, I, would, uh, I would hold on to them. And, and I worried, like, what, you know, what if, it's, what if, what if this isn't, it has no reality and they're g giving their lives away? But I knew that even if, even if there were no God, that was a good life. You know, that was a beautiful life, a holy, sacred life. Um, I, Thomas Merton writes about the first time he goes to Gethsemane and he realized, he said, I realized it was the axis on which the world was turning. And I had a very similar experience. I don't know if it's because maybe I had read Merton and I had read that, but 
even, I don't think I'd read Merton when I was eight years old. I'm sure I hadn't. Um, I had that kind of experience of, of, you know, wow, this is a radical thing to do with your life. And even if it's not what I would do with my life, or even if I don't even believe all the same things these guys believe, um, it just, I don't know, it just so, it, I, I just distinctly remember being in college, you know, experiencing doubts, waking up in the middle of the night thinking there is no God, there is no God. And immediately my mind would go to the monks. That's, I don't, it's true. That is the first answer that pops into my mind. But um, what else can I say about that? Do you have doubts now? You're oh, a professor, sure. you're oh, smart. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. You're a teacher. I, I, yes, I have doubts about myself, most of all. <laughs> like everything you just said might not be true. <laughs> um, yes, I have plenty of doubts. And I, and I feel, I feel um, you know, I'm in a... For those of you who don't, Caitlin graduated from here a couple years ago, and yes. she's a student at Harvard Divinity yes, School now. So yeah. I tell Stephanie, everybody at PW is kind of like Caitlin now. And which is what I have found. But Caitlin just wrote a brilliant paper on Virginia Woolf and Process Theology, so I'll have to check that out. But so back to your doubts. Uh, back, right? yes. Um, um, yes, I have plenty of doubts, and also I'm just in an environment where it's just challenge, challenge, challenge all the time. Not just challenges to your faith, challenges to what you think this committee ought to do, challenges to what you think the ministry program ought to do, challenges to what you think the MTS program ought to do. I mean, it's just, it, it's, everything's contested every minute of every day. So I'm full of doubts all the time um, about whether I'm doing the right thing or, you know, um, what I believe. But um, as I was saying this morning, we had a little bit of a conversation about this this morning. Um, when I was, my first job out of graduate school, I taught at Valparaiso University in northern Indiana. And I was fortunate enough to be drawn into a project led by a woman named Dorothy Bass, who was working on a book called Practicing Our Faith. I don't know if anybody's read it, but she wanted to write a book about Christian practices that were not the usual Bible study, prayer, him singing, whatever. They were things like hospitality, honoring the body, um, dying well, um, saying yes and saying no. Just really basic human things that all human beings have to learn how to do. Um, and, but that religious traditions have wisdom about because they've been thinking about it for how to die, how to offer hospitality, how to care for your body, etc. for, you know, millennia. And for me, that that notion that you might st it might be possible to start from practice rather than um, rather than proposition was very liberating for me. And Ellen pointed out to me that this is a very Jewish idea as well. And it did feel to me like a, a reconnection to Judaism and Christianity. That this interest in practices was was like that. And um, you know that you could you could like not be sure about all of this theological stuff, but you could still just jump in and start serving people who need help, or you could just jump in and start accompanying someone into their death, or you could just jump in and try to figure out how to make choices um, that were moral and just, um, and that you could practice your way into Christian faith, um, rather than first working through all the problems. Do I believe in virgin birth? Do I, you know, is Jesus God? You know, all those really hard, big questions. Um, I think sometimes in Christianity we act like, first you work all that out in your head, and then you go and do. But life hardly ever works like that. And, and we do, I think, find our way into our, what we believe through act through practicing and experimenting and trying things out, um, which is why I love Simone Weil's experimental certainties. You know, you can't. There are things you can't know unless you just practice knowing them and finding out what difference it might make if you believe that. Um, you can't. You know, what, what sense does prayer make unless you're trying to pray and seeing if prayer makes a difference in your life? Um, well, you know, any. I mean, anything. You know, service, prayer, faith, um, these are things we have to try on and try out and see what difference they make. And I think we act our way into our, um, into our beliefs in that way. And that has been, um, Jonathan, has been one of the most uh, helpful things for me in relation to doubt. Um, because it, it, does, it just makes, it doesn't, 
doubt, I think, sometimes looms as this huge thing that roars up in your path and you have to solve it before you can take one more step. Um, and if that's the case, we'd never of us take any steps. Um, that can't possibly be right, right? I mean, lo religious life just has to be a life of faith and doubt and moving between them constantly. And, and I don't even sure that thinking of them as two separate things that we can move between is even right. Um, that this is just all part of, you know, the difficult work and the joys of being a religious person. Um, but um, I, I can't even remember whose question I was answering, and I hope I haven't gotten too far off the track. Is that right? Is that, is that? Yeah, I think the, the whole, the notion that we don't have to figure it all out before we do something has been very, that has been a real blessing to me. I'd be willing to entertain a couple questions from you folks out there who are sitting up here behind the table, if there is such. Judaism, there, there are, you know, we read the Hebrew Bible, there are things that you are supposed to do as a Jewish person. And there are prayers you're supposed to say at certain times, and there are things you do with your body, and there's foods you can eat and that you can't eat, and, um, and that these material things, that embodied things, really matter. And that you might feel one way or the other about them, you might be believing at the moment or not, or but that... That's not as really important as, as doing the things that you're supposed to do um, and doing them because God commands them. And, um, and I think Christianity has had a hard time thinking in that. Christianity has been so interested in you know, nailing the 95 propositions to the church door as Luther did, and, um, which is, I, I don't want to sound anti-theology because I'm very pro-theology, um, but, um, this notion that all of the that that the very naughty K N O T T Y not naughty uh, not is ill behaved um, questions posed by traditional Christian faith um, have to be solved before you can be a Christian. Mm -hmm. I just think that's that can't be right because those questions are are perennial questions. They're questions of a lifetime, and it's will never solve them all. Um, so what does it mean to be a Christian? Does it mean to believe certain things, or does it mean to do certain things, or is it some combination? Ellen, am I doing okay? Yeah. Great. Oh. I'm really sorry. I have to go. You want to add anything before you go? Yeah, I thought that was beautiful. Couldn't Ellen have said it, it, it any differently. Oh, well. She's waiting to see if she can trust a I know. Protestant. To That's right. I know. I know. I know. I'm like, wait. Beautiful. Well, um, so yeah. So that's what I mean. And emphasis, I mean, I, I think that belief versus practice is too simplistic a way to describe Christianity and Judaism. Um, I do wish Ellen had heard me say that, but she's gone. <laughs> so somebody tell her I said it. Um, <laughs> um, I think you know it's kind of a it's kind of a stereotype of Christianity and Judaism. But there is some it does come from somewhere, and it, there is some truth in it um, that Christians do get, or at least the Christians that you know I remember growing up with in Eastern North Carolina. The, what made you a Christian or not was what you believed your assent to particular propositions. And that is very important. But can we believe those things with the same fervor all the way through our lives? I think we go up and down. It's like reading St. Therese. One year she sounds like a genius. One year she sounds like a you know, spoiled brat. <laughs> you know, it's, it's our lives change. Our li you know, we're moving through life. They, you know, life is not static. We're having experiences. Things are happening to us that you know pose particular challenges to what we believe. But if they're what what I find consoling about the emphasis on practice is that you know it's it's possible to keep on practicing through all of that. And 
I, I may have told this story already, but, but when I first became a minister, um, I took a group of students on a retreat at a monastery in Wisconsin, the Order of Julian of Norwich, which was an Episcopal um, order. And one of the monks met with us, and he was talking about the daily office, gathering for prayer four times a day. And he said, I don't do it because I like it. I don't, some days I like it. Some days I don't like it. Um, he said, I do it because I said I would. And I thought, I, I sat there, I remember thinking, that just sounds like freedom to me. Like you don't have to, it's not like, oh, should I, should I get up and pray? Should, do I feel like it today? No, it's, I, I, I did it because I said I would. And there are things I'm going to learn because I show up and do it. Um, it's like the French Huguenots I was talking about, I guess, this morning. Um, has anybody ever seen the film Weapons of the Spirit? You should see it or read the book. Um, it's about this French Huguenot community um, during World War II that sheltered thousands and thousands of Jews. Um, they were, you know, they were uh, not a monastic community. They were just a bunch of Protestant families in France. But they had these very highly practiced, finely honed practices of hospitality. So when the knock came in the middle of the night, it was not, well, am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to go to jail? It, it was just, you open the door, you bring people in, you feed them, you get them a place to sleep. It, it, it just removed um, all of the drama around making the decision. Just that these practices were so hardwired into these people. And that's, I want that for myself. I, I'm so far from being that kind of a heroic person, but I, I do feel like the only hope for me is to have something like that hardwired into me um, so that I do the right thing because I'm just used to doing it. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm trying to practice, I'm trying to practice being better. <laughs> challenging question. Um, it's easy, especially I think for students of religion, scholars of religion, teachers of religion, to you know, to hear Richard Dawkins and to say, you're arguing with, you know, whatever fundamentalist raised you and you're not, you don't even know anything about religion. It's easy to be dismissive that way. Um, academics are good at that. Uh, not, I'm not looking at Alan because he knows what I mean. Right? <laughs> Just because he knows what I mean. Um, but I, you know, I actually, I'm, I'm considering this question probably for the first time. And I think, I guess my initial answer would be the, you know, trying to just, you know, kind of getting at what you were getting at, Jonathan, in your question. Um, you know, what are the, what are the desires and the questions and the impulses that are leading us to raise this, have this conversation in the first place? You know, why press atheism? Why press non-atheism? Why, you know, what, what are the things that are underneath it? And I, I do think that when we look at the things that are underneath these conversations, we have quite a bit more commonality than when we're arguing about dogma. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say, because I haven't really read closely Dawkins or Harris or any of these people. I, I just read about them, and so I think I know what they think, and maybe I don't. But it does seem to me they are the perennial questions about, you know, what, what makes us moral? You know, what, how, how can we be good? And the, those new atheists seem to be saying you, religious people seem to think we can't be good without God, but, but human beings in themselves are good, and, and so we can be, and we should celebrate that without always looking to some invisible being or some, you know, world beyond ours. We should focus on this world. I mean, that's, a, that's an ancient 
argument even within religions. It's an ancient argument inside of Christianity. You don't need to go to atheism to have that argument. Um, so, um, so I guess that would be that. That's the first thing that comes to mind is to look for the for what's driving it. What's at stake? What what's at stake in in these conversations and in these perspectives? Good answer. Thank I'm gonna, you. I'm going to wrap this up oh. by doing one thing at the end. Um, one of the reasons I like this format as opposed to the other lectures, it's, it's nice to have somebody like Stephanie come in and do the, the lecture. It's, it's well thought out, it's clear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but. A, an occasion like <laughs> this gives us a chance, and us, maybe particularly the students, but I enjoy it too. It's watching the professional actually you know, applying her craft. She doesn't know what they're going to ask. She's figuring out how to use what she knows. Um, and that's obviously the way a lot of the world works. We don't always have time to write the lecture, prepare the speech. And so that's good, and it's the kind of thing I think anybody in my position hopes all the students learn to do. And we probably don't give you all enough chance to do it. We maybe don't even give you enough chance to watch it being done and to hear Stephanie say, I don't think I ever answered that question before, so what am I going to do now? Well, as a Quaker, I'd just be quiet, but she's got more courage than, than I do. But that's why we like to do it. The second thing I'd like to say is I love these occasions where, in this case, it's the lecture series I sponsor, but it's a time that you all who don't come here every day come onto a campus and participate with me and Stephanie and students. Uh, right now, we're all BW. So I just declared that with all the power and authority you know, there, that's too. Um, and, the last thing I'm going to ask from Stephanie is, you came yesterday at noon basically as somebody who didn't yeah. know us someplace in Berea, you know, yeah. um, and now it's really only been 27 yeah. hours later. As you're ready to leave, I guess it's a chance for us to say, you are a mirror. What did you see and what's been your experience as you leave us to continue being BW as you go back to the oldest university in this country? Well, thank you for that question because I have, I have had such a good time here. And um, it's, I think in part it's because I am very reminded here of what got me started on these questions to begin with. I, I started with the religion colloquium yesterday, which was wonderful. And it reminded me of my dad's students sitting around our house and our backyard and lying around the floor and playing their guitars and talking, 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 talking about God and, you know, everything else and prayer and the war and everything. Um, and I was so grateful both today, these are wonderful questions and you all have done a fan, fantastic job, and the kind of conversation we were having yesterday in that colloquium where people were really bringing out these very powerful experiences. I went to Dachau and here's how it affected me. Oh, I was there too and I had completely the opposite experience. You know, j just really people being very honest and. Um, really getting at immediately what's at stake in the study of religion without messing around. Um, I, I think you're so lucky to have this community um, and to have these professors who obviously care so much about you as students and the alums who have come back. That is very moving to me um, because it does feel like BW that it's not just the people who are here now, or the people who graduated last year, or, you know, some <coughs> closed off set, but, but that, it, you know, there is room here for, for people to keep participating and keep being part of the conversation. And, even, and people also who aren't students here and aren't teachers here, but are members of the community who are also contributing to this conversation. So I think you're just so lucky um, to have this place and especially this religion department. Um, I, you know, teaching graduate students, it's easy to see, um, you can just tell what kind of departments people came from. And so knowing Caitlin, I knew a little bit about you um, because she obviously had such a profound preparation and <coughs> was obviously still so in conversation with John Gordon, with Alan Culp, with her professors here. Um, so I guess I would say this is a pretty special place. And you know what? It's not going to be long before a lot of this stuff that we do right now is ha going to happen online. 
And I'm not say, I don't want to sound like a Luddite, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, and there's ways in which that's going to open the world in ways that we cannot foresee. But doing this, sitting in a room with our bodies all together in this room, and holding texts that we love and ideas that mean something to us and questions that are preoccupying us um, and talking about them together, don't ever take that for granted because it's going to be more and more rare, I feel. Um, and this is a really, this, this to me, this is really living. So um, thank you. Thank you. Let's give her a hand.